So some people may ask, why is queer justice important? It's important to know that not every community is accurately represented in the media. I was inspired to create this show out of the need to accurately represent my community. This is Jay Daniels. And welcome to Queer Justice. Welcome back to Queer Justice. Today we will discuss trans rights in America and the epidemic the transgender and gender nonconforming individuals, also known as TGNC community, are under fire from the Trump administration. As you could see, we have more than one guest here. The intention was to invite a diverse representation of TGNC folks who are all organizers and leaders in doing great work to fight for trans liberation and justice. I want you to join us in this thought-provoking, radical, self-love space with these warriors who invest their lives for the trans liberation. I've been waiting a while for the trans messiah to show up, so now I'm going to just kick back and relax. I'm going to allow y'all to do the work <laughs> because, okay. okay? So let's start off quickly with everyone's name and pronouns, starting with Sasha. Well, so. Hi, y'all. I feel like we all have been in spaces together, but um, my name is Sasha Alexander. I'm the director of membership at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and I use the pronouns he and she and they and insist that you mix it up. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Isa. I work for Trans Latina, and um, my pronouns is she, her. Hi, my name is Charlotte Shum. I work for Trans Latina Network, and I'm a peer health advisor, and I go by she and her. My name is Olympia Perez, and um, I am the co-director of Black Trans Media, and my pronouns are her, she, and they. Thank like you. the chocolate bar. Like the chocolate bar. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that. I'll go by they, them today. So before we chat, I want to give our lovely audience who keeps returning to tune in to hear these amazing folks' bios. So Sasha Alexander is a Black South Asian non-binary person, healer, organizer, and artist. They're the director of membership at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, where they provide free legal services to New York City's TGNC communities, as well as organizing and leadership trainings to engage in protests and lobbying. One interesting fact they wanted to share is that SRLP is a collective. They don't have an executive director and believes in non-hierarchical power structures and decision making. Elizabeth Isa is an Ecuadorian LGBT activist and peer health educator at Trans Latina Network. Growing up in Ecuador, where she was rarely accepted for being trans, was rough and intimidating. Her experiences of suffering discrimination and rejection led her to focus on activism and stand up for the rights of those who are left behind in society. Through Trans Latina, with the organization's help, she will work hard to become a role model for the community and continue to fight for equal rights. Olympia Perez is an Afro-Latina trans woman raised in Brooklyn. She's a poet, healer, multimedia artist, and the content director at Black Trans Media. She's a trans warrior who currently organizes to dismantle failed ideologies that have never served her trans communities. At Black Trans Media, Olympia shifts and reframes the value of black trans people through media education and community building. Charlotte Schum was born in New York City. She is the peer health advisor at Trans Latina Network. She enjoys applying creative solutions to challenging situations and believes in the goodness and equality in people. She feels advocating for the acceptance of others is more than good work. It is a responsibility. In her words, there are so many ways that we can approach life, so many strengths that we overlook and weaknesses that we dwell on. I want to change that. Wow, that was a mouthful, and it's always empowering to be around folks that are doing amazing work. Like I said before, I guess y'all could just leave the movement and I'll just sit back here. And um, when do y'all rest? Well, no? you can't leave. For it doesn't work that way. No, we got to <laughs> rest. Rest is part of your resistance. Right, right. Rest for resistance. Okay, so now for some questions. Charlotte and Elizabeth, can you, can you speak briefly on the importance of the work Trans -Lat Latina Network serves our community? So, Olympia, what about black trans media? Why the need for a niche representation of black trans folks in the media? The reason for black trans media is we are 
the reason we exist is to push back against the constant erasure that our black trans bodies are subjected to every day. There isn't work exacting on our experiences as black trans people. Navigating and looking for different ways that we can survive in a, in a climate that is constantly hunting us for the bodies that we live and exist in every day. So I think some of the ways that black trans media has done that and continues to shift the narrative and reframe the ways in which black trans people are interacted with. And some of the ways that we do that is through community, education, and media. We have a biennial film festival that we hold, and we're bringing artists, media makers, um, multimedia artists from all over the country um, for them to come to this space and share their work. We're also holding monthly events where people get to be a part of a storytelling journey with mm. other vibrant folks and share electrifying stories that really reflect the many experiences that we hold as black trans people. Um, and I just think the, the our presence has been really important um, for a lot of folks that I've interacted and had the pleasure to have conversations with in which they are sharing that this has allowed them to feel free in a system, in a world that is constantly limiting our possibilities. I think black trans media is really important because the analysis that we push forward is one that is always intersectional and yeah. always bringing identities and other folks' experiences into the conversation when oftentimes that isn't what is happening. Thank uh, you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Sasha, could you tell us about your work at Sylvia Rivera Law Project and how you and your wife, uh, Olympia, both re-energize re yourself to continuing to do activism? Sure. Well, let me, I'll start by talking about the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. So it was founded in 2002 by Dean Spade, who is uh, a white trans man who's a lawyer. Uh, he was at a fellowship at the Urban Justice Center at the time. And he was finding, like our community knows, that we experience so much discrimination and harassment, all these different places we go, you know, whether it's a public space, whether um, uh, employment, housing, right? So he started to provide legal services directly to TGNCI, trans and gender nonconforming and intersex folks, because we were experiencing so much harassment that when we even went to legal service providers, they were also not culturally competent. So they didn't even understand how to actually practice someone's case because they didn't understand the nuances of being a trans or gender nonconforming person. So he started providing those direct services and um, you know, he has a lot of transformative politics that he believes in and, and quickly uh, founded the Sylvia Rivera Law Project as a collective organization with uh, other folks. And it's grown into um, this incredible both legal service providers, so people, a lot of folks know us for providing direct legal services, um, but we also have, where I come from, a really strong movement building base um, of folks in the community whose leadership uh, we're developing, who lead and drive our campaigns, who we support through building political education, community, um, and we've done some pretty incredible work over the last, we just celebrated 16 years. Congratulations. Um, just this week, so that was really exciting. And you know, that's part of our multi-tiered like, um, strategy in terms of believing that the law is an important tool in people's lives, uh, but it's also, um, it's like Audrey said, the master's tools can't dismantle the master's house. You know, laws are also inherently racist and transphobic mm -hmm. and classist and xenophobic and, right, um, we're here on the stolen land. And there's all these things, there's all these reasons why laws also in many ways um, can't be the ultimate the, the only thing, right, mm -hmm. that works. Um, and so that's why we also believe like movement building, building communities is also what's also pushed laws, pushed policies, pushed our communities to kind of develop strategies. So right. my work there um, uh, is incredible. Is incredible, but I mean, really, it's because of the incredible people that I get to work with. We like have Olympia, like, like Olympia. Work. Olympia so has been a powerful member and organizer. Um, at one point, I mean, she's still part of our movement building team there and was part of like building this analysis around the cosmetic exclusion with healthcare denials mm -hmm. and things like that. She's been very instrumental. And we also work together in, in our black trans media work. And I think um, 
I feel very fortunate because a lot of folks in our community are really isolated mm. to uh, be in a working relationship and married to mm. another trans person, another trans person of color, mm. um, another radical um, trans person so of color. And I think that's one way that, that helps me not feel, I think sometimes you can feel, um, uh, like there's a lot of mainstreaming in our communities right now. Like, you know, like a lot of people want justice, what we think is justice, right. but is actually harming other parts of our community. That kind of like, four steps forward, five, six steps back kind of thing. Right. Um, and so I think um, by being able to like be in relationship and community with another person who I love, who is struggling through those things, it helps me kind of ground. And I think another big self-care thing is like, just like as an organizer or as an activist, you develop tools, like you have to develop tools around taking care of yourself in this work. Like we were talking about rest, like it's part of your work, you mm. know, it's part of your work um, to take I get care it. it's of yourself. Like you don't Rest it, you're not stopping to rest. You're sure. resting as part of moving sure. forward. Sure, and some people don't think about, like there was a period where Sylvia left the city and she was living in upstate New York and she pulled Self back care. from activism. Yes, and had to take care of her health care issues. And, and you know, like working with community is very intense mm. and, and can bring up a lot of stuff. Yes. you know, in terms of the dynamics. So I think, you know, being able to have people around you that you can build with, like building the families, building the communities that we are building at the places that we're, you know, doing this work is a really important way of how we take care. Thank you for that. And in lines with justice, I want to talk about the time we're living in. So in 2017 alone, according to the Human Rights Campaign, accounts 100 anti-LGBTQ bills in 29 state capitals across the country. With the National Center for Transgender Equality in 2018 recording 10 states that have introduced 21 anti-trans bills and two states uh, and two states are considering anti-trans ballot initiatives like Healthcare HB 1341 in New Hampshire, the notorious HB 2 bathroom bill in North Carolina, and the anti-youth bill 65 in Indiana. So again, with you, Sasha, because of your work at SRLP, so what are some bills and policies since Trump's first year that have impacted the community or SRLP's work? Sure, I mean, that's a great question. And some of it we know is not Trump specific, but a lot of it is, um, you named a lot of those kind of larger national kind of context of laws and policies. And again, I'm a, well not again, I'm a non-legal advocate at a, at a law project. So I think a lot of what I understand about what's happened is some of the things actually haven't been laws and policies, they've been threats that have terrorized our community upon already being terrorized. Um, and so folks who are already vulnerable, who are already discriminated against, right? The messages that are getting put out there, whether we're talking about uh, migration and immigrants and the Muslim ban, the registry, right? Or the threats around trans students and repealing their protections. Fear tactic. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and literally rolling back executive orders. So, you know, one president signing something in, another president signing it right out. Um, you know, SRLP takes a pretty different stance than a lot of people around the military industrial complex. So, um, you know, in terms of trans people being denied access to serve, I think we take a different maybe uh, stance on that than other folks, but obviously that is a huge issue for a lot of TGNC people who are low income or folks of color. Uh, and get pushed into the military industrial complex and serve you know, the country. Um, and so those were issues. Just like this week, uh, he, I think similarly, um, Trump um, tried to pull back protections for TGNC prisoners, yes, folks we'll who are in fil facilities, which is a lot of SRLP's work. We've done a lot of tremendous work throughout New York State and New York City, you know, in the, in the trans housing unit and other places. So those are pretty scary, um, some of them are threats. I think some of them are actual like realities and in we're terms not of like citizens. Um, like it's sure, it's like a house sure. that's burning down. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think in other ways, I've seen a lot of lawyers also not want people to feel like um, not wanting to anticipate something that's happening until it actually happens, um, because there's already a lot of anxiety for mm -hmm. folks, you know. Um, but I've also seen like a lot of push to develop more legal support specifically for TGNC immigrants during this climate mm. so folks can have access to support um, and care. We talked about um, that in our previous episode. Yeah, and I think that's not a new issue. Like there's yeah. amazing TGNC activists who've been doing this work for a very long time. And they're not getting but attention. But to have a national kind of messaging around 
trans folks, around immigrants, around black folks, around women, around Muslims, to have this very repressive conversations about all these marginalized groups is just pretty scary. I mean, because you know, you already have people that feel this way about our communities, um, and they very well could be lawmakers or policymakers. And if they weren't, they're being informed by this, by these conversations. So I think it's challenging for a lot of our communities because people are just trying to survive yes. um, on like some very basic levels, um, and to put out this kind of um, put out this kind of um, language or energy or laws or policies um, or, or executive orders uh, is definitely. Um, it's been overwhelming. I'll say as an yeah. activist, as an organizer, I think the last couple of years have been really, really, really tough. Like mm -hmm. him making announcements every Friday, very yeah. strategically, you know, so that people either can't mobilize or it's hard to mobilize, kind of burning yeah. out communities by, you know, all of this, you know, announcement after announcement of things he's doing to harm people, you know? Um, so I think it's really created, I also think obviously it's created a, a, an environment where our communities are trying to bond together mm -hmm. and trying to organize um, and folks who maybe haven't organized together or haven't built within communities are coming it's an together. Yeah, so I also think, you know, yeah, in our organizing work, we always think about threats and opportunities. And while there are a lot of threats in what's happening, there's also been like t trans people part of national conversations and a whole lot of things that, you know, otherwise, like we might not be part of a national conversation right. around. Now, there are definitely things that aren't like the violence against trans women of color that haven't we'll been conversations, but yeah. I think obviously, you know, there's like a double edged sword to, to some of those things. So, the, this violence and fear and this like terror is like even approaching, increasing in here in New York. And sure. I also want to touch on gender and the importance of the failure it was to pass. So, as of May 15th, the Gender Expression Non Discrimination Act. Um, also known as Genda, was defeated in New York State Senate by a five to four party line vote. The measure would have amended the state human rights law to bar discrimination on the basis of gender identity or expression and would have added trans people to the state's human rights law. So anyone could touch on this. How would this setback will affect our community here? Um, I feel very discriminated since let's say the new government came up and start doing his new changes, mm. especially I was feeling it was straight to the community. Uh, knowing it was a time back a couple of years ago, we was having those situations like transgender women trying to use bathrooms equality. So with the new government, it's like instead to walk two steps up, we're going back, mm -hmm. backwards. So I feel like intimidated for that. I don't think those changes it make uh, everybody, especially in the community, um, secure. Mm -hmm. We feel like uh, we put it on the side and we never feel like to speak up because it's new things. What about you, Charlotte? And I, f <coughs> like I find it frustrating because um, Elizabeth and I, we work on the forefront. Uh, we see a lot of of our communities who are living in shelters, you know, and those are considered the lucky ones. There are some people who have been working, they have a degree and a master's, and for whatever reason, they were ejected from their careers, and they were blacklisted, and it's just so frustrating because not only are you handling, trying to juggle your family life, but these policies or, or this denial of like equality is actually giving even your family members ammunition to shoot down who you are. And um, like even like for myself, I struggle with that and it frustrates me um, because when you put into question like love of your child versus something you hate, it's very, it's very like painful to see that they would even dwell on that comparison. They're like, yeah. Mm. Olympia. Mm. I, I'm thinking about some of the rights that gender is covering or is supposed to cover and those are some of the laws or policies, rights that we are supposed to have now. There's supposed <laughs> to be no discrimination, right? We're supposed to be respected for, uh, for who we present in the world, and yet that's not being respected. I 
really just think about if this passed or not, there needs to be um, a system in place that, there needs to be a system in place that has um, considerable and sustainable resources to provide an oversight that will be able to support folks that are having a negative experience while navigating the world under these policies or these protections. I think oversight will be really important now um, and um, moving forward as these things shift. I would love to just add two things sure. to the conversation. I mean, one thing I think, um, I mean, which Olympia brought up is like here in New York City, like there are stronger policies and protections than there are across New York State. Right. And there are plenty the of blue, there are plenty of the blue teachers. Dot sure, in like sure. A red like state. many states, right? Yes. But here in New York City, even there are plenty of people who are discriminated against, who are harassed, who under those policies or protections, whether they're in a shelter, for example, or whether they're accessing a bathroom, there are, are executive orders or there are policies that DHS has, for example, around TGNC people's safety and privacy that aren't followed. And Culturally. so I think that's the fear in having a stronger law or policy is that a lot of these laws and policies don't have teeth. Like we don't see on the ground, we don't feel the effects of them. So trans people are discriminated against every day. And whether the Commission on Human Rights is not able to f support those folks through their claims, or there's no accountability from these businesses, from hotels, whether it's transportation, wherever, the MTA, whoever it is, you know? So I think that's one issue. The other thing is I would encourage people to read SRLP has taken a stance and not and um, not lobbied. We don't particularly do a ton of lobbying, but not support agenda. And it has been a long stance that we've held that has not always been popular to people in the larger community, um, but is because that gender would increase hate crime statutes and essentially increase policing of our communities, the very communities that we they actually want to protect. Yeah. And that's, that's been something that SRLP has put out statements about and has tried to have other folks in our community understand like the very protections you think you're gonna have are actually gonna be used against our communities to further criminalize our communities. Mm. And our communities are already being targeted by law enforcement, right, and in prisons and jails. So I would just, I would encourage people to read th those statements and just think about, Where can we find you know, those statements? Um, you can find them, that's a great question, at srlp.org. And if you look in our little search and you type Genda, you could totally find it. Or if you type Perfect. in Genda and Sylvia Rivera Law Project, we've been very public with it over the years. And it's been a struggle because we don't wanna, our mission is around discrimination and harassment and violence. We don't want right. to see our communities you know, further targeted, but we also don't wanna see something created that actually could harm low income people and people of color further in these systems that are already being harmed. You Thank know. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah. Like, I would have not known, and that's no, why course. we need the more. That's the why we have queer justice. Yeah. And yeah. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and trans Latina and Black trans sure, media. Right it's, on. it's not just a one collective, you know. It's true. It's together. So on May 12, 2018, Reuters reports the Trump administration has just rolled back protections for trans prison inmates introduced under the former President Barack Obama after some prisoners challenged the policies in court. An inmate's biological sex will now be used to make the initial decision as to where trans prisoners are housed, instead of the gender to which they identify, according to a change in guidelines announced on Friday by the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. So I know, Sasha, that you do work around um, incarceration, but I'm just going to ask a question to Charlene and mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Um, how do the rollbacks of these policies add to the intersections of one being trans and Latinx and their access to healthcare, legal protection, and citizenship? Uh, well, I would say for, um, especially for Latin um, transgender community, we suffering or we have a problems right now trying to find a legal service. Mm -hmm. Most of us, we're trying to... And they get imprisoned for that. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to have a documents however way we can, but it's impossible because it's... Most of the lawyers trying to do a lot of work for us, but it's not enough mm. because we've been discriminated. And anything we do in the street now, knowing we are transgenders, it's against us. So that means it's... It's easy for them to take and saying, you're transgender. 
you are not allowed to be for legal assistance or housing or any kind of studies. And plus we suffer, like, even though if we have documents, we suffer to getting a job. Mm. Because they, you know, they, the first thing they ask you is documents. Then mm -hmm. when we explain to us we are a transgender or something, mm -hmm. they react to give us a job. So it's, it's, it's a problem. So there's housing issues, housing issues, legal protection. You're just not treated like a citizen or a human being at all, you know? It's for that, and that's what we mean about with the intersectionality mm -hmm. of just, so maybe, I mean, we heard briefly, but maybe Charlie could talk more about like the resources Trans Latina comes in to providing those people, to helping them and supporting them. I mean, a lot of what we do is uh, social work. We, mm. we work in these safe spaces and we have peer counseling. Mm. So we try to... Bilingual, uh, right? Bilingual. Mm. Um, I'm not bilingual myself, but okay. I do work with a lot of Neither clients as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, not in Spanish. <laughs> so in general, like, um, we, we try to really uh, get to know our, our community and our clients and we do our best to serve their needs, but in cases where it's like legal services, that's where our SRLP comes in. So then we do a lot of referrals um, depending on. Oh, so you work with other organizations. Yes. 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 And you work with SRLP as yes, well. Yes, we, we have sent like clients there. Um, we, we've sent people for anti-violence violence. And SRLP project. also has yeah. bilingual services, right? Yeah, yeah, so we have some about? folks, yeah, in our legal intake, there's translation, uh, our attorney, who's our director of our Immigrant Justice Project, right. um, uh, is bilingual, Perfect. and um, we have a lot of shared membership and folks, mm, yeah. um, and things like that. Right, yeah, and Sweet. there's there's like a lot of difficulty in finding, for example, housing. Mm. So in, in order to do that, we can't, we have to kind of know more about their story you know, did they suffer domestic violence? Because that is an into the housing market, mm -hmm. allowing them to get shelter. Prior it's kind of sad that in order to get a house, you have to be abused, you have to be homeless, you have to be, you know, like in a really horrible state of oppression. It's like pre-existing mm -hmm. health. Why, or why do mm -hmm. people have to suffer in order to giving them, yeah. to prioritize them for housing mm -hmm. yeah, in New yeah. York City? Yeah. yeah, and even people who can afford the rent they go to, the renters, they will not. There was this uh, person who was trying to rent an apartment, and when they talked over the phone, everything was smooth, but mm -hmm. when she went into person, all of a sudden, the, the person showing the apartment forgot where the apartment was. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was so absurd that they found a person's like gender identity to be so um, impactful on how they treat you know other people even though it's illegal mm -hmm. as you were yeah. talking about mm -hmm. Sasha in, in New, New York, York City, City yeah. the culture doesn't add up that's yeah that's what people tend to forget they think rules change cu culture it's it's I don't know how to say it but like social change hopefully <laughs> changes culture and it's not enough for the rules even in this a so-called liberal city, a diverse city, an accepting city as we call it. There's sure. so much garbage that happens against our community under the seat, under the table that people are like, oh no, it doesn't happen here. And mm -hmm. it like we're kind of like suffering at times mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. silence. Yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about health, Charlotte and Elizabeth. So access to health resources and we were talking about freedom from incarceration is a major obstacle in our community for liberation, but we should also talk about those what we those that we have lost due to hate crimes and violence, unfortunately. I wanna watch and then discuss a short poem titled 35, written by Sasha and directed by Olympia through Black Trans Media, which, was, which is one of my favorite but sad performances on the short lifespan of Black trans folks. Let's take a look. Thirty-five, by Sasha Alexander. How old are you? I know it's true. 
I'm not supposed to ask. I'm only 29 myself. I just need to know how long we have to last. My wife and I are black and trans, and nights we've held and cried that we'll be taken for defending ourselves or arrested by the state. They've tried. Detained in the 79, arms cuffed behind your back, held 24 hours in that cell. A young girl we know died in there just last week. This is the place my love was held. It is one in three, three-fifths a person, 35 if you do the math. Within 50 days, more than 15 deaths of trans women. 35 is no longer the age. 35 is no longer the math. I'm 28. My wife's 24. 35 seconds every day before we walk out the door. I know we both wonder and we hold it in fear. Sometimes we say it out loud. Sometimes we speak it through tears. That her name will be Islan, Amanda Milan, or Dewana. That I am Kai Peterson, Samaya Blake, and Cece McDonald. Can you imagine not being able to leave the house without threats? Fearing for your children and family? 35 is the average age based on the rate of violence for a black trans woman's life. I'm scared we only have 10 years left, afraid of the beating in my chest. <sighs> the threat is real, every day on the street, in the subway, and on blocks, but we have the power to change this, and we have the power to stop. 35 is just a moment. Welcome 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, 95. Now do the math. In the 35 seconds that just passed, we can transform the way we support black trans women, and I will be proud if you ask. How old are you? So by raise of hands, how many of you know a TGNC person that was either murdered or attacked before they hit the age of 35? Um, Olympia, um, can you talk briefly, what was the inspiration behind the poem 35 and how else is black trans media are highlighting the unheard voices towards black TGNC folks? I will answer, so Sasha, wrote the poem and had been talking about this inspiration that had been growing in their chest for a, 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 a little minute and they produced it and as they shared on the video it's all about our life expectancy oftentimes trans women of color are reserve 35 as the average age or life expectancy and we know that not to be true it's actually more like 23 and we were talking and, ha and organizing around the violence that we were facing as black trans people as trans people of color here in new york city and beyond and i think sasha did a beautiful job beautiful. at really so beautiful. encapsulating i think the feeling and that sort of eagerness to survive in a world that is constantly like forcing you limits and i think I don't know, it's just really intense. Every time I watch it, I just, I, I get the feeling of wanting to hold on to survival and having that chance for all of our community. Um, and it also just brings me back to the idea of black trans media, something that I did not mention before. It was started in 2014 after the death, the murder of Islam Nettles mm. in Harlem. And it's really about that we as trans people, we have, um, power we have community we have love we have the ability and the capacity to organize in different ways in different mediums um, and that's important to uplift and create space or reserve space for um, and then you ask about um, no you did it you great. okay <laughs> thank you so much for your work both of you thank you um, so in episode one on how to be a queer ally we discuss the high rate of violence and murder of TGNC folks in 2017 and shows statistics by Human Rights Campaign and Anti-Violence Project.
but there is new research of increased violence according to Cloud Media Institute. In their March 2018 publication, More Than a Number, Shifting the Media Narrative on Transgender Homicides, in 2017, 96% of the victims were trans women, 92% were people of color, 58% were killed in states that passed anti-trans legislation. All this past year's reported murders of the TGNC folks were committed in cities whose medium income was below the national average of $59,000. Even our esteemed leaders have been killed off by transphobia, like Brandon Tina, who is an American trans man who was raped and murdered in Humboldt, Nebraska in 1993. His murder was a catalyst for lobbying effort for hate crime legislation and inspired the controversial film Boys Don't Cry, played by a non-trans actress, Hilary Swank. And of course, the legendary Marsha P. Johnson was an African-American trans woman who was an LGBTQ rights activist. She was tragically murdered on July 6, 1992 at the age of 46, where her body was found dead floating in the Hudson River, Manhattan and her death and murderer is still a mystery. So, according to Kiara St. James, the founder of New York Trans Advocacy Group, she solidified the levels of trans community-based solutions in three areas, being macro, as in legislative, maxi, meeting with local representatives, and micro, what does the community immediately need? So, now for everyone, if you could just talk briefly what are solutions your organizations are looking for to better serve our community? At Sylvia Red Law Project, some of the solutions that we believe in, no matter what I think the issue is, um, is transforming things. So we don't simply believe that reform will, uh, will get us there <laughs> to our liberation. Um, and so we believe that one of our strategies is to address the larger institution, the larger systems, the root causes of the things that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the ways we're able to do that is by providing a direct service. Mm -hmm. So one strategy we have is like in the immediate, um, like folks need legal support. Like this is gonna continue to happen while we get laws and policies right. and while we continue to fight. And so we can continue to provide those legal services. But in the long run, like the end game, you have to, we have to organize around right. what's happening and we have to mobilize folks and help build our community skills. A lot of our folks have been pushed out of school, pushed out of homes, pushed out of opportunities. And so a strategy we have is as a movement building team, we create this weekly space where our folks can come, get a meal, connect, build their political education, drive our work, um, and yeah. it really just serves so many purposes, but I think a strategy is being together and creating mm -hmm. space. And for our communities, I mean, we're named after Sylvia, like, you know, rest in power. Like, she had makeshift housing on the pier. Like, space was a super huge issue for our folks. Either one of you from Trans Latina, can you also talk briefly of what does your organization, um, you know, is fighting for and is looking for in terms of? I mean, our uh, Trans Latina Network is looking to equip our community with more skills, reintroduce them, and recalibrate them to uh, re-enter the workforce. Mm. And uh, we believe in investing in, like, our youth. Uh, we want to expand into that direction at some mm. point. And because while some of us um, may not have the energy to continue to fight because of all the trauma we suffer. Our youth are strong and we need to support them. I feel there are resources out there, but I, I want to focus more on the youth in general. Thank you. And briefly, Olympia, where does Black Trans Media want to move forward? Um, we are moving forward in our new project that we have that we shared with community, Spaces That Place. We are We've had interviews from folks talking about the direction that they would want to go in in terms of thinking about ways to make um, housing more accessible um, for our communities with less barriers um, and less violence, trying to navigate that. Also, just creating, um, continue to create, like I mentioned before, um, our monthly events where we're bringing people in and uplifting mm -hmm. their work. Because oftentimes, as black trans people, we don't have folks telling us whatever it is that you create is good enough to celebrate. 
So this is what we want to bring into the space, um, into movement, and also we want to encourage other folks and other organizations with our analysis, right, that we can do this and disposability should not be a theme in our community. Pushing mm -hmm. our folks out should not be a theme in our community because what we're doing is practicing a culture that's genocidal to all of us mm -hmm. because we're practicing how to push out, how we're going to face the backlash that we get when we do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's what Thank we you. are working on. Thank you so much for this um, opportunity. So can everyone provide a short statement of anything that I haven't mentioned today that you want people to know about? About your work, about liberation for the community, any issues or perspectives that people are not seeing that's problematic, you know, mm. ways that we could be more sensitive, anything. And anyone could go. You want to go? Specifically, Linda? I just wanted to say also I touched briefly on it, but the idea that at an all time high and constantly historically, like black trans women specifically, but trans women of color are being pushed out of organizations that are saying that they're serving our communities. And there is a pushback when folks are trying to talk and bring into the conversation, the problem and the violence with tokenization, right? And how that is not sustainable for our communities. It is not investing in us. But when we, you say that we don't have the skills or whatever to move around in space, um, this is why we're being pushed out. I think that it's really violent and it's really um, colonial, especially when we're doing work against the state. We are mimicking and mirroring exactly what the state do does to us. And now we are in a place where we have nonprofits, we have organizations that can shift the narrative, that can continue to push back against the idea of disposability. And I feel like here in New York City, I'm struggling to see that. I'm constantly engaging with folks being pushed out or the fear of speaking out against injustices in their own organizations mm. because people are going to push them out. And I think that's not the way to go if we're talking about building a transformative, restorative future for all trans people here in New York City beyond globally. Mm. Um, yeah. Thank you. That thank you. So thank you. That was really powerful. Um, Charlotte, anything? Um, if no, not, I, I think... I think our community is is great, but we need to hire more trans folk into our organizations. There's a lot of nonprofit and work. And also non-LGBT <laughs> organizations. Yeah, exactly. And there's like a lot of capability there and people just aren't tapping the resource enough, you know? And mm. I think this would help um, provide them motivation and that is a rippling effect to the rest of the community as well. Mm. Elizabeth? I just was saying, you know, um, just keep fighting for our community, you know, and every needs we need. Just don't just back up, just keep going. Let's make everybody understand we're here to support each other and let's make the organizations, you know, trying to listen in wherever they feel like to speak up and fight and keep continue to do it. I guess just real quick to bring back to like central issues that we're working on in our movement building work is like healthcare access is a nightmare for TGNC people. Even with the law changed, folks are still having a lot of issues in accessing whether it's like access to surgeries or hormones and also housing. So many of our folks are in the shelter system, have already been pushed out of their homes. So these eviction programs aren't going to help us or um, been pushed into jails, into facilities, other places. And at SRLP, we have a shelter organizing team that right now mm. is trying to really um, leverage folks who are in the shelter system, help folks know their rights, and help really um, put some pressure on DHS and on the city. So I hope folks, just to say, our legal intake reopens next Thursday um, from 1.30 to 4.30. So Yeah, um, we're going to post all the information wonderful. online. So you've all met today, five TGNC folks. And I want people to know that we exist, we are human, and we deserve to be equal and free as every other American. But unfortunately, 89% of people um, in America still don't know someone who's trans or gender nonconforming. And when they do, they have all their biases about us. So in our episode today, we discuss within trans liberation, societal and community-based issues around violence, immigration, anti-LGBT legislation, imprisonment, and solutions for the future.
There's always so much more topics to delve into and so many more amazing TGNC folks like we met here today to befriend, love, and work together towards liberation. Remember, every movement needs allies and you could be a pivotal role in supporting this, mov in supporting this movement. The revolution doesn't end here. As we have listed online, a bunch of organizations you could plug into to push the arc of justice in the right direction. Look up events in your area of Trans Day of Action, Trans Day of Remembrance, and Trans Awareness Week that can guide you to resources of activism involvement. Now, thank you again, everyone who showed up. Um, I know we're kind of stretched out, but can we all try to like hold hands? And if we could close our eyes for a second, and I really bless us all to continue to have all the good that we need to move forward to find answers, to find hope, to find clarity and fulfillment, and to know that we are being valued for the work that we are doing. Thank you, uh, amen. Oh sure. Oh sure. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank everyone you. could do a little shimmy for me. Come on, everybody shimmy, everybody shimmy. <laughs> okay. Is that ha what happens on Queer Justice? That's <laughs> apparently, I'm just trying like my little thing. Thank you to our audience far and wide for tuning in to the first uh, season of Queer Justice, where we managed to have healthy and mature conversations, as well as pull through discussing heavy issues our world is facing and humans who are being violated their rights daily. I hope to see you all soon for season two. I'm your host, Jajay Daniels, and always be you, be true, and stay fabulous. Thank you. In 2017, we have lost 28 TGNC folks across America due to hate crimes and violence. So often, we don't see our identities being humanized and memorialized like other people. I want to take time to do justice for the people that we have lost, to say their names, and for you to remember who they really are. We remember Mesha Caldwell, a 41-year-old black trans woman who our community lost to violence in Canton, Mississippi in January 2017. Mesha was a beautician and a hairstylist, and according to a friend and an advocate who knew her, she loved everyone and never met a stranger. Often ap after Mesha's death, friends, family, and loved ones left an outpouring of messages of love for her on social media. Other folks are Tiara Richmond, age 24, China Gibson, 31, Sierra McLevin, 26, Derricka Banner, 26, Scout Schultz, 21. We remember Jojo Stryker, a 23-year-old black transgender woman who our community lost to violence in Toledo, Ohio, in February 2017. There was an outpouring of grief for Jojo on social media following her death and her family believes strongly that her murder was a result of hate and bias. Jojo Stryker was an amazing queen, an amazing warrior, and we remember her. As we remember Alfonza Watson, 38, Shay Reed, 28, Kenneth Bostick, 59, Allie Steinfeld, 17, and Stephanie Montez, 47. We remember you. Ready? We remember Jaquarius Holland, an 18 years old black transgender woman who our community lost to violence, to violence in Monroe, Louisiana in February 2017. Friends say that Jaquarius loved makeup, hairstylist, and R&B. One friend remembered Jaquarius saying, you were a beautiful soul. You can call keep me laughing all day. Same for our folks, Sheree Fortner, 46, Kenny McFadden, 27, Kendra Mary Adams, 28, Candace Town, 30, Brandy Seals, 26. We love you. We remember Sean Hake, age 23, a transgender man in Sharon, Pennsylvania, who died on January 6, 2017, after he was shot by police responding to a 911 call from his mother. A friend told WKBM that Sean had a genuinely heart of had a genuine heart of gold. We also remember Ava Larray Barron, age 17, Ebony Morgan, age 28, TT Jangerfield, age 32, 
and Brooklyn Brianna Stevenson, age 31. Rest in power. We remember Jamie Lee Wounded Arrow, age 28. A Native American two-spirit was found dead in their apartment in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. A suspect, 25-year-old Joshua Ravon LeClaire, has been arrested and charged with murder and manslaughter in connection with her death. Other names that have hit the mainstream but their abusers haven't been caught. We remember J. Lo McClory, 29. Guinevere River Song, 26. Kiwi Herring, 30. Kashmir Nazir Red, 28. 